Hi everyone. So I decided today to do a little bit of a focus piece on the poet Mary Oliver um, because she alongside with uh, maybe um, Rainer Maria Rilke are probably the two poets that I will turn to in desperate times when I really need something to make me feel something again and to remind me how I feel when I'm at my strongest spiritually at the altar. And these are the two poets that just bring me back into that feeling uh, the fastest and the easiest and who have really resonated with me um, all the way along this journey so far. I haven't made a faith food video in a really long time and in fact it's a series that I started at a time when I think I really needed faith food. I really needed to be reading and imbibing things that were inspiring my pantheism, inspiring my spirituality and um, I was still struggling through it at that time and I think for that reason I both wasn't yet maybe engaging with enough material uh, as I needed to, uh, to get myself fully back on track uh, into my spirituality. And also I was working through it myself. Um, and it's a little bit hard sometimes when you're working through something yourself to be sharing it with other people. So I'm back again today to do another of this series because I have, of course, again, been going through difficult times during the pandemic. I think we've all had our own ups and downs, mostly downs, uh, sadly, over the last uh, 15 months. And trying to wade my way back into my spirituality, my spiritual practice, um, was a big one for me. And I also have been suffering a lot from depression in the last six months or so. And one of the things that I started to do to pull myself back out of that depression was to read certain books. I picked out um, a few different books that I knew were going to immerse me back into um, that spiritual state of mind, that pantheistic frame of mind that I just really needed. So I've picked out five poems um, from a collection. I have like a new, new and selected poems, volume one. Um, but I'm going to read through each poem, parts of each poem maybe for you, and just talk through what exactly it is about her work and specifically these poems that I've chosen that inspire me, that our faith food for me that just helped me to maintain my faith in this uh, divine pantheistic universe that I have chosen honestly to believe in. So the first poem I've chosen is called Roses Late Summer and it's from her collection A House of Light that was printed in 1990. What happens to the leaves after they turn red and golden and fall away? What happens to the singing birds when they can't sing any longer? What happens to their quick wings? Do you think there is any personal heaven for any of us? Do you think anyone, the other side of that darkness, will call to us, meaning us? Beyond the trees, the foxes keep teaching their children to live in the valley. So they never seem to vanish. They are always there in the blossom of light that stands up every morning in the dark sky. And over one more set of hills along the sea, the last roses have opened their factories of sweetness and are giving it back to the world. If I had another life, I would want to spend it all on some unstinting happiness. I would be a fox or a tree full of waving branches. I wouldn't mind being a rose in a field full of roses. Fear has not yet occurred to them, nor ambition. Reason they have not yet thought of. Neither do they ask how long they must be roses and then what, or any other foolish question. So this is a good example, I feel, um, for me anyway, of um, the way or one of the ways that Mary Oliver wrote about um, animals and the difference between a human rational living, the, the way of moving through the world in a rational way and wondering and philosophizing and fearing the future. And she has this fairly idealized idea of animals as being more present in the world and more capable of being, um, of living in, maybe not harmony, but at least living in the moment. Uh, and a desire to um, give over to that way of living, which I think is quite common in these kinds of um, romantic with a capital R type um, poems that, uh, that do have this idealized understanding of nature and as humans of being somewhat separated from it uh, through the way that our minds work. And that it is this great tragedy of how our minds work, that they are very powerful and um, that they can create amazing things, but at the same time that they can distance us from a more pure or um, easier or happier way of living. I think the structure of this poem also really speaks to attention in my own spiritual practice and my own spiritual thoughts and beliefs uh, between 
a desire to philosophize and to wonder and to come up with answers and to um, dig into scientific discovery and philosophical discussions about consciousness and whether or not we can have any rational belief in a consciousness persisting after our death. Um, but that then is is juxtaposed against this desire to avoid and evade all of that rational thinking and to um, embody a very different way of being because I spend most of my life in that very rational state and so there is always this desire in me to go beyond the, ra the rational to be fully present in a single mystical moment um, and yeah I think that the this poem embodies that in one very specific way for me. So the second poem that I chose was The Journey. I believe that this is from, yeah, it's from her collection Dreamwork from 1986. This poem for me taps into the, the desire to strike out on my own and do something that when I first started on this spiritual path, it felt um, perhaps irrational and as though I were separating myself from the society that I was in and from the culture that I had grown up into. Um, and it really speaks to me for, uh, of all of the struggles that I um, work through many of my clients with as well. And just this knowledge that there is something very important that needs to be done that is not necessarily going to be easy, um, but that has to do with uh, individuation and being an individual and following up on your own needs um, and desires, but I think needs um, more fundamentally. <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll read the whole thing for you, it's not very long. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and a wild night and the road, road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognised as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. So there's obviously so much to unpack in this poem beyond what I've just said about that desire to break out into the world and strive for your own, your own spiritual practice. There's an awful lot more in there and that can be interpreted out of that and that is relevant to me in other ways as well. But that was just how specifically it speaks to me in terms of my faith, I suppose. I chose another poem from Dreamwork. I'm actually not going to read the whole thing because I think there's just too much to delve into in it. So I'm only going to read you the third stanza which is the third out of seven. Um, but I'm sure you can find this online if you read, want to read the whole thing. The god of dirt came up to me many times and said so many wise and delectable things. I lay on the grass listening to his dog voice, crow voice, frog voice. Now, he said, and now, and never once mentioned forever. I think that probably speaks for itself. I. I almost just, that's kind of why I didn't want to go through the whole poem. I almost don't want to start pulling it apart and explaining what it is that is really evocative for me in this. But um, there is something in that that really touches on the heart of my own faith in a divine cosmos and on just that dark awe that I feel at times of really heightened spirituality at the altar in moments in nature and so on um but yeah i'm not going to get into that too much but i wanted to read out that stanza because i think it's it's one of many short sections of poems that come back to me again and again over the years and that have become very meaningful to me over time and um, i think even just even just the phrase the god of dirt uh that has become um, meaningful to me and I have I'm definitely going to get, get into a few other poets that I have similar little phrases from that have stuck with me as well um, but yeah that's probably one of the most important stanzas for me from her work and it's not necessarily a poem that is um, 
comforting to me. It's not one that I'm going to reach for for comfort, but it is one that is an important part of all the different layers of influence um, on my spirituality. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to read from a poem. It's from, I think it's from the Night Traveller uh, collection from uh, the 1970s. And um, I'm going to read this poem for you, even though it's not, I don't feel like it's as connected to my spirituality per se. Um, there's definitely a segment in it that uh, is evocative to me of certain parts of the doubts that I have about the nature of reality or some of the questions that I have and it just reminds me I suppose of just my own relationship to other people and so on but it's just a, a poem that I find particularly moving and I just wanted to add it into this collection anyway because again I think it's something a little bit different to um, the other poems that I've chosen here. I could have chosen so many and leaving out so many important ones as well um, but these are just the ones that I felt yesterday when I was flicking through that I wanted to share. So it's called Aunt Elsie's Night Music. Aunt Elsie hears singing in the night, so I am sent running to search under the trees. I stand in the dark hearing nothing, or at least not what she hears, Uncle William singing again Irish lullabies. I stay a while, then turn and go inside. Uncle William's been dead for years. Climbing the steps, I think of what to say. I saw a bird stretching its wings in the moonlight. There were marks on the grass. Maybe they were footprints. Next time, I'll be quicker. She's as wrinkled as a leaf you carry in your pocket for a charm and fold and unfold. She's so old, there's no hope. She's so crazy, there's no end to the things she thinks are happening. Strangers have taken her house. They have stolen her kitchen. They have put her in a cold bed. It is summer. The singing grows urgent. Twice a week, sometimes more, I am called from sleep to walk in the night and think of death. I have been to the graveyard. I have seen Uncle William's name written in stone. I snap off the flashlight and come in from the darkness under the trees to the bedroom. Aunt Elsie is waiting. I lean close to the pink ear. Maybe this is what love is, and always will be, all my life. Whispering, I give her an inch of hope to bite on, like a bullet. Again, I feel like I'm not going to delve into that too much because there's almost too much in there to be said about this poem. Um, but I think part of why I wanted to bring it up today is just the, the imagery that it evokes and that particular feeling, the poignancy, um, and also the slight air of mystery and possibility, weirdly, that goes along with that experience of being of going out into the night looking for something that you don't that you know is not actually there. Um, there's a poignancy to that, but also this sense of uh, patience and um, that looking to find something in the dark and that sensation of being out uh, in the dark at night in a garden, um, listening to the night, and the night takes on a different kind of texture and smell and um, a space, a garden, a, a patch of trees, a wood can be completely transformed at night. You get completely different smells and sounds and almost feels like a totally different place. And that's what all of this reminds me of. And there's something about that experience. There's something about being in a place at night as opposed to during the day that again, it taps me into, it, it reminds me that things change, that things are not always in this ordinary state, that we don't always have to approach life in the same way over and over again. And even if we get into a rut of feeling as though our lives are stagnant and um, our lives are boring and that they are predictable and that everything that we do every day and everything that we see every day is just always the same, it's always rational and there's nothing more to it, that there's no magic to it anymore. Um, I think it's there's always a change waiting at some point in your life. There's always a possibility of um, reading something, of having someone say something to you, of having an experience that is just going to transform um, even the mundane parts of your life and shine a completely different light on them and you might hear Uncle William singing. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about this for today. I wanted to keep this video pretty short and I didn't want to get too bogged down into uh, analyzing details of the different poems. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of one poet that I adore and some of the poems that give you a, um, an overview of the different 
the different types of moods and experiences that have been evocative to me and that have helped me on my journey. Um, like I say, um, Mary Oliver is hugely important for me. Um, this is the main book that I will reach to when I'm depressed and it helps. Um, and I have, maybe I'll make an actual, a full video sometime of um, a list of books that I reach for when I'm depressed that might include um, things that are less associated with my spirituality, like just fiction and, and things like that that are important to me. If that's something that any of you are interested in, um, let me know in the comments down below and I will consider making that video. I'm definitely gonna do um, more faith food videos in the future. I want to do a whole video on Reina Maria Rilke as well because he's very important to me as well. And also I wanna do various different books and so on and even TV shows or movies or documentaries and things like that. Um, and add them into this series over time, this faith food series. Um, so if you have any particular requests or anything, um, then do let me know, although I'm probably gonna be focusing on things that I've already read, that have already become important to me. Uh, and as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Mary Oliver. I know that she's a poet that unfortunately sometimes um, doesn't get the critical acclaim that I think that she should. I think because she is so, um, she's very approachable. Um, her work is very approachable and it's, it's very accessible and therefore very popular. And unfortunately material, literature like that is sometimes not fully appreciated, I feel, um, always by critics. Um, not across the board by any means. I do think that she was very much appreciated during her life, but um, I always think that's a bit of a shame because I think just because some, a work is accessible doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of depth to it and um, that there isn't a lot that you can get out of it. So yeah, those are my thoughts. As I say, let me know in the comments what your thoughts are and also what are your faith food books? What are the things that you reach to when you're in a faith crisis in particular? And um, yeah, I'll be talking to you again soon. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, please do like the video if you enjoyed this and you wanna see more like this. It's helpful for me to see uh, how many people are enjoying and it's also helpful for the al algorithm of course and if you haven't subscribed already then do consider doing that and hitting the bell so that you are notified when I upload a new video. Okay I will stop talking now I will talk to you again soon. Bye thanks for watching.